Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Snailus, where medicine makes perfect sense. This is the second video in my playlist on pulmonology. It's part two of clinically oriented anatomy of the thorax. With that being said, now let's get started. In the previous videos, we have discussed the bone and the muscle. Today, and we had two cases. Today, we'll answer these two cases and talk about soft tissue. Before the lung, we have the tracheobronchial tree. Between the lungs, we have the mediastinum. And then we'll talk about the lungs. Around the lung, there is the pleura and then the lymph nodes. Flail chest is freaking important and freaking fatal. Multiple rib fractures, paradoxical movement, fix the ribs with hooks and wires, lest pulmonary contusion should occur. The sternum is very hard to break or to fracture. Therefore, if you find a fractured sternum, look for a hidden disaster waiting to happen, such as traumatic rupture of the aorta due to a deceleration injury, cardiac contusion or pulmonary contusion. Pulmonary contusion shows a white out of the lung on chest x-ray and deteriorating ABG. I didn't say deteriorated, I said deteriorating. It's getting worse and worse and worse and even worse. Case number one from the previous video. A person was stabbed by a knife in the anterior chest. The knife penetrated straight forward to the heart. Which of the following chambers is more likely affected? And the answer is right ventricle because it makes most of the anterior surface of the heart. If we can draw the heart like this, beautiful heart. Here is the right atrium. Very tiny if you're talking about the anterior surface. And then the right ventricle is gonna be like this. The majority of the anterior surface is made of the right ventricle. Then we'll have something tiny above called the left atrium. And here is the left ventricle and it's even smaller if you're talking about the anterior side. This is not a very good drawing because the apex is made of the left ventricle. So it's kind of like this. Still, the right ventricle constitutes the majority of the anterior surface of the heart. Case number two, we had a patient car accident and then in the beginning he was fine then the abg was deteriorating ph is 7.31 this is acidosis pacio2 is high so the acidosis is because of high co2 this is respiratory acidosis hco3 is 30 which is high because the kidney is trying to respond and then pao2 was 93 which is okay because normally it's around 197, 95, something like that. 24 hours later, more acidosis. So it's a deteriorating ABG. PaCO2 has increased. That's more respiratory acidosis. HCO3 is 34. The kidney is trying to do its job. PaO2 is decreased. And I've told you also that the oxygen saturation was decreasing. Chest x-ray showed white out of the lung field. Answer, this is a pulmonary contusion. This is very important for your exam. As I've told you before, a contused lung is very sensitive. Sensitive to what? Sensitive to fluid overload. How do you manage it? Drain the fluid. Diuretics. Don't give fluid. So the answer here is F and C. Fluid restriction, diuretic administration. Cardiac tamponade can kill you, but it doesn't cause that respiratory problems in the ABG as much as the contusion. Tension pneumothorax can kill you, but then on the x-ray you will find mediastinal shift. And you will find shorts of breath. And when there is shorts of breath, you will find respiratory alkalosis and not acidosis. Pneumonia, x-ray, alright. Osteopetrosis. X-ray would have been diagnosed. Hyaline membrane disease is neonatal respiratory distress syndrome, and this is an old man. It's not this one. Pulmonary contusion is the correct one. Spontaneous pneumothorax is never going to be that bad, and it doesn't cause a white out on the lung or the deteriorating ABG because your other lung is normal. Hemothorax will affect only one pleura on one side, but not the other side. It's not going to deteriorate the ABG that much. Hemodialysis is wrong. It's not a kidney problem. Renal transplant, his kidney is fine. It's actually responding to the respiratory acidosis by trying to cause a metabolic alkalosis. Pleurodesis occurs when you have pulmonary effusion and then we treat you pulmonary effusion and then we treat you pulmonary effusion and TB and pulmonary effusion. And then we decide, you know what, let's close your pleura as if it doesn't exist. Needle decompression. Needle decompression is used for pneumothorax or tamponade. 
if it's the heart pericardial window is used for temp cardiac tamponade bronchoscopy with a biopsy it's not cancer call the cardiothoracic surgeon immediately it's not a c a b g this occurs with myocardial infarction when you have like three vessel disease and diabetes and everything is like when the bleep hits the fan let's talk about the mediastinum what's the mediastinum it's the space between the two lungs and it's divided into superior mediastinum and inferior mediastinum what divides the superior from the inferior a line that passes through the sternal angle of louis this one and it's very important in physical exam let's say you want to um, auscultate the heart and you want to reach the fifth left intercostal space how do you count the ribs and the the uh, those spaces intercostal spaces here's what you do. you put the finger here in the suprasternal notch of the patient then you go downward until you find an elevation a ridge it's actually very prominent what's next to this this ridge is the second rib you put your finger underneath this is the second intercostal space third fourth fifth here is the apex of the heart inferior mediastinum is divided into anterior middle mediastinum and posterior mediastinum what divides the inferior mediastinum into these three compartments and the answer is the heart causes of mediastinal mass the famous four t's thyroid mass thymoma teratoma and a terrible lymphoma mediastinitis itis means inflammation so it's inflammation of the tissue in the mediastinum usually bacterial not viral due to horrible stuff rupture of organs in the mediastinum could be rupture of the aorta or the esophagus horrible or spread of bacterial infection from a retropharyngeal abscess this abscess or this retropharyngeal space is a dangerous space abscess or an infection there is very risky because it can spread to the mediastinum and this can be fatal pneumo mediastinum pneumo means air mediastinum it's air in the mediastinum this air in the mediastinum so pneumo mediastinum can lead to pneumothorax so we have air in the pleural cavity pneumoperitoneum you have air in your peritoneal cavity pericardium, you have air in the heart and it can go as both ways you can start with a pneumothorax leading to a pneumomediastinum you can start with a pericardium leading to a pneumomediastinum you can start with a pneumoperitoneum leading to pneumomediastinum causes same thing so causes and complications are the same these conditions frequently accompany Braff syndrome when you have reaching and strong vomiting until your esophagus ruptures or spontaneous esophageal rupture which is not because of the vomiting why then the mediastinum definition when you're looking at an x-ray it's if it's an upright posture anterior x-ray it's more than six centimeter is called the widened mediastinum if it's the supine it's eight centimeter causes of a widened mediastinum very very important and i'll help you memorize them a a e e m v a start with the most horrible thing anthrax inhalation Woo. and you know anthrax is a bacillus a bacillus is a rod a rod so a rod aortic aneurysm aortic rupture aortic unfolding aortic dissection then you have two e's esophagus and heart because heart is has an a so esophageal rupture cardiac tamponade or pericardial fusion then we have mv the m has the oma and the itis cancer is painless inflammation is painful mediastinal mass could be a thyroid mass thymoma teratoma or terrible lymphoma those are benign and malignant some of them benign some malignant hyalur lymphadenopathy could be cancer or infection cancer is painless infection is painful mediastinitis which is fatal and you have vertebral fractures such as the thoracic vertebral body fracture why vertebral fracture okay normally your vertebra is like this tiny boxes and it gives you a nice shape of the skeleton let's say that's now it's like this all right if you had a lung here and a lung here now we have a lung here and a lung here the distance between them is widened it's a widened mediastinum a stab wound to the anterior chest can lead to two fatal things one cardiac tamponade two tension pneumothorax let's talk about the tamponade cardiac tamponade blood accumulates forming the tamponade positive pressure decreases venous return decreases cardiac output cardiac tamponade equals sudden loss of pulse plus the back triad what is the back triad jugular venous distension so here's your heart you have lots of fluid around your heart your veins cannot drain into your heart the venous pressure is going to rise leading to distended veins 
This is called jugular venous distension. Hypotension, because there is no venous blood coming to the heart, there is little blood going off, out of the heart, so there is less cardiac output, you'll have hypotension with a narrow pulse pressure. The pulse pressure is the difference between systolic and the diastolic. If your heart is not going to pump any blood, it cannot pump, the systolic is going to be low. Since the heart is surrounded by fluid all over, it will cause equalization in the fourth chamber during the diastole, so the diastole is high. Systole is low, diastole is high, this is a narrow pulse pressure. Distant or muffled heart sound. You put the stethoscope on the chest, you cannot hear the beats clearly. Why? There is fluid around the heart obstructing the auscultation. Pulsus paradoxus, we'll talk about this in cardiology, electrical alternance. All right, so your heart is floating and swinging inside this water or this blood. It goes to the right, goes to the left, goes to the front, goes to the back, it's dancing inside. So the AKG is also dancing. So you have low voltage like this. Then you have a high voltage like this. And then you have another low voltage like this low voltage, high voltage, low voltage, this is called electrical alternance. In cardiac tamponade, you have no shortness of breath, and this is a huge difference between cardiac tamponade and tension pneumothorax. Do you mean that like in zero cases? No, like it's it's possible, but it's less likely than tension pneumothorax. Diagnostic image, do not order a chest x-ray, you're wasting your time, it's a clinical diagnosis. If the diagnosis is not clear, order an echocardiogram, it will show the fluid beautifully. How to relieve the tamponade? There is blood around the heart, okay? Decompress this pericardium. Pericardiosynthesis with a wide bore needle into the fifth or sixth intercostal space. Please be careful not to injure the internal thoracic artery. Don't be stupid. Pericardial tube or pericardial window or even open thoracotomy, which is a cut through the chest to relieve the pressure. Do not give vasodilator. You will decrease an already low blood pressure. Your heart cannot pump. Okay, so your blood pressure is low, and you're giving a vasodilator, what kind of a stupid are you? Forgive my language. Next, we have the trachea. Tracheal shift or mediastinal shift. All right. In cases of tension pneumothorax, let's say that this lung has tension pneumothorax here. Pneumothorax is like the valve. You know your tire? We want to add pressure to your tire, but we don't, the, we don't want the pressure to escape the tire when you are driving your car. So you put a tire valve. Same thing, sometimes you have a valve. So air comes into your chest, but it doesn't leave. It comes into your pleura, but it doesn't go back. It comes to your pleura and doesn't go back. The pressure is gonna be positive, and normally the intrapleural pressure is negative. When it's positive, you know what does positive pressure do? It pushes stuff. It's gonna push and push and push and shift the trachea towards the normal side. So here is the first example, tension pneumothorax, it pushes the trachea towards the normal side. Other example is massive pleural effusion, same thing, lots of fluid here, it's going to push the trachea towards the normal side. Opposite to that is pushing the trachea towards the affected side. In other words, the diseased area or side will pull the trachea towards it. Example include pulmonary fibrosis. So here is your normal lung here. Here is your fibrosed lung. It's shrinking and it's horrible. So here is the visceral pleura and here is the parietal pleura. The distance between them has increased. According to physics, when two surfaces come closer to each other, they create positive pressure in between. When two surfaces go away from each other, they create a negative pressure in between. This negative pressure is gonna do what? Negative pressure sucks stuff. It pulls stuff. It's gonna pull the trachea towards the affected side. And that's a big difference. Other example, so we have the pulmonary fibrosis and you can have sometimes consolidation pneumonia. So causes of tracheal shift towards the normal side, this is tension pneumothorax or massive pleural effusion. Causes of trachea shift towards the affected side, this is pulmonary fibrosis. With medicosis, you will play with medical information like it's a non-issue. Tracheal tug, not the shift, but the tug. Okay, so here is your nice sternum. All right, here is the fine manubrium, and here is the angle of Louis, and then the body, and then the xiphoid process. Here, it is called the suprasternal notch. When you put your hand here, you're trying to feel if the trachea is central or not. But in some patients, when you put the 
fingers in the suprasternal notch to feel the trachea and ask the patient to breathe in, your fingers are sucked inward. <gasps> and you can't find your fingers. What, where do they go? Causes. Descent of the diaphragm to a very low level called flat diaphragm. Let's have let's say you have a barrel chest and emphysema This diaphragm is gonna pull everything downwards including the trachea especially during breathing or inhaling So your fingers are gonna sink in another thing is aortic aneurysm. It's pulsating pum pum when it pulsates positive pressure when it depulsates or the other in the diastole It's gonna be negative pressure and negative pressure sucks stuff the carina. The carina is this space between the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus. We can call them right main bronchus or right principal bronchus, not to be confused with the principal of your school. All right, causes of spreading out of the two main bronchus. So they have an angle between them. Let's say that normal angle is like this. What causes them to be like this? So the angle here is becoming more obtuse. I'm feeling like geometry and like I'm, I'm an engineer or something. So what causes this angle to increase? All right, we have lymphadenitis. Let's say that you have a crazy lymph node here and this lymph node is enlarging. So it's gonna push the two main stem bronchi away from each other. By the way, the name of this lymph node is called the tracheobronchial lymph node, excellent. It could also be a cancer in the same freaking lymph node and it's gonna increase the angle. Detected on bronchoscopy, okay, because the bronchoscope is here and there is a camera, so you can see that the angle has increased. CT scan, of course, x-ray, this is for experts, not for medical students. If you are a medical student and you can say that the angle between the two mainstream is increased, you're a genius or something. Carina is the most sensitive area of the tracheobronchial tree. Let's say that the kid inhaled a peanut and it's here. It's gonna cough, 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 cough. It's very sensitive. But if the peanut passed beyond this junction, the kid is not gonna cough anymore, which is horrible, by the way. Mommy is gonna smile because he's not coughing anymore. But a disaster is waiting to happen. Chemical bronchitis due to the substance released from the peanut. The peanut can block a, block a bronchus or a bronchial, leading to a collapse of the segment. Let's say that here's a segment, here's a bronchial, and it's blocked by a peanut. The segment that's being fed by this bronchi will collapse, called obstructive atelectasis, and we'll explain this later. After mommy is smiling and happy, dyspnea will follow. Another example is the dentist who removed your tooth but forget to take it out, you swallowed it, on, I mean inhaled it, it can lead to the same thing. Third example is the dentist but it's not like a tooth, it's like a filling material. So hey dentist, make sure you hold the tooth in your hand firmly and document it for future references. I'm just trying to be funny. The two main bronchi, the right main bronchus is shorter, wider and more vertical, it's like this but the other one is more horizontal, like this. So the right is more vertical. Therefore, let's say that you inhale the peanut, it's more likely to go to the right main bronchus than the left because it's vertical, it's called gravity, baby. So it's if it, it's a foreign body, if it's an organism, if it's even like aspiration in an elderly unconscious patient, same thing, more likely to go to the right lung than the left. What happened if you aspirate a foreign body while upright? So it's gonna go this, to the right or left lung, answer right lung. Where exactly? It's called gravity, so it's gonna go to the right lower low because you're upright. Let's say you are lying on your right side and you inhale the peanuts. If you're right, lying on your right side, the peanuts are gonna go to the right lung, of course. Where exactly? Like, follow the gravity. It's, it's here, okay? So the gravity will pull it here, not here. It's gonna be the right upper low, okay. Let's say that you are supine, use your imagination. So here's your lung, your supine, so we're taking a cross section. And here's the carina, here is the other lung, and here is part of the trachea, all right. All right, and this is the lung. Inhale the peanut. Right or left, of course it's gonna be right lung, okay. It's gonna be lower or upper, it's usually the lower. And it's usually the superior segment before, because you are what, you are supine. Use your imagination, it's not that hard. So, mechanism of normal, quiet breathing. Not that you're running a marathon, normal, quiet. You're sitting on your lazy boy and you are drinking tea at tea time, if you're an Englishman. They make the chest wall, the chest wall expands during, ex during inspiration, the chest wall expands, 
chest wall deformities such as kyphosis, scoliosis or kyphoscoliosis, the air cannot enter in, the lung is restrictive from filling, it's called a restrictive lung disease. Muscles. So inspiration is an active process, you need muscles. Expiration is a passive process, you don't need any muscles because you have the lung recoil. It's called potential energy in physics. Let's say you have muscle problems. Do you think you're going to have problems with inspiration or expiration? Of course, inspiration, because expiration is already passive. It doesn't need any muscle. Defective inspiration, you cannot get the air in. It's called a restrictive lung disease, because restrictive lung disease, you cannot get the air in. Obstructive lung disease, you cannot get the air out. Also, you need some joints during the breathing, so if you have osteoarthritis in the rib or something, it's going to lead to breathing problems. If this is going to be an obstructive or a restrictive lung disease, the answer is restrictive lung disease. You cannot get the air in because of the joints are weak. Oh, it hurts. But the collapse or the recoil of the lung is still functional. As you know, the right lung three lobes, the, the left lung two lobes, and it has like a cardiac notch because it has to give place to the heart because the ventri left ventricle is going slightly to the left. Each lung segment is a separate entity. So here's the main bronchus, and here is some small bronchi, then bronchial, and then lung segment. Every segment is a separate entity. It has its own bronchus, artery, vein, and nerve. You can surgically remove one segment without disrupting the whole structure of the lung. If an abscess or tumor blocks a bronchus here, or a bronchiole, air will be absorbed via blood. So let's say that you have blocked this one. Air that was here in the segment is gonna escape to blood, all right? Why not to other segments in the lung? Because there are some fibrous septae here, and those fibrous septa will not allow the air from one segment to go to the other segment. It's like your kidney nephrons. Do you think the urine one nephron will jump and go to the other nephron? It's not gonna happen. Every nephron is a separate entity. Then all of this air is gonna be absorbed into the blood. The segment is gonna be empty of air and it's gonna collapse, called segmental atelectasis or obstructive atelectasis. Atelectasis means collapse, all right. A means no. Ectasia means widening or dilatation. Tele means distant. So, the distant bronchioles are not dilated. Hashtag collapse. But TB or cancer are horrible. They will lead to what? Breakdown of those septa between those segments. So now it can affect just one segment then the next segment, then the third segment, then it might even affect the whole freaking lobe. You have to remove the whole lobe called lobectomy. And can even affect an entire lung. You have to remove the entire lung called pneumectomy. If a patient is unconscious, he is at, at risk of aspiration pneumonia, you should change the position frequently. So you change the position frequently to prevent DVT and also aspiration pneumonia. Let's say that you are a patient and you're producing lots of sputum because of an infection or something. Lie prone, which means on your stomach, and then you can empty your lungs easily. You're gonna cough a lot, but you're gonna empty it and you are going to feel better. Let's say that I would like to see these bronchi and know which one is obstructed. Use a technique called bronchography. All right, so here is your first rib, all right? The pleura projects superior to the first rib. Therefore, wounds to the root of the neck can actually injure the pleura because it's like it's in the neck, it's not in the thorax. Reactivation of TB, as you know, goes to the apex of the lung, right? And this will require auscultation above the first rib because most of you will put the stethoscope, okay, right, left, right, left, show me your back, right, left, right, left. This is stupid. You have to start from the apex of the lung, which is above the clavicle. But if you'll just auscultate four times in the front or four times in the back without the apex, you'll tell the patient, sir, you're fine, you can go home. That's how you die from tuberculosis because your doctor is a stupid. Physiologically, the pleural movement during inhalation, exhalation, 
is very smooth, no sound whatsoever. But if you have pleurisy or pleuritis, which is an inflammation of the pleura, it's going to lead to friction between the two surfaces. <laughs> this is called a friction rub. Inhalation, <laughs> exhalation. <laughs> if you're struggling with the staph, strep, legionella, mycoplasma, all of this crazy stuff, the microorganisms and the pharmacology, please try Picmonic. They have excellent medical mnemonics. They are animated and like videos and it's, it's just amazing. See the link in the description. Let's compare between pleurisy and pericarditis, especially the fibrinous one. Pleurisy, inflammation of the pleural sac surrounding the lung, inflammation of the pericardium surrounding the heart, chest pain, anywhere in the chest because the pleura covers your freaking chest, okay? But it doesn't cover like the center, so it's gonna be more peripheral. This is gonna be more central. Chest pain here is pleuritic, which means it increases on inhalation. <gasps> ah, it hurts. But this pericarditis, it's not related to breathing. So the patient doesn't describe it. It hurts more when I breathe in. No, that's not the pericarditis. This is pleurisy. Yep. In pleurisy, pain worsens on breathing or coughing or sneezing and improves on holding breath because when you hold breath, pleura and lung do not move. Here, the pain worsens on lying back because when you lie back, on the bed, you're stretching the pericardium. And when you stretch the pericardium that's inflamed, ew, it's gonna hurt. This pericarditis pain improves on sitting down because you are not stretching the pericardium. And leaning forward, in some cases it can increase on inhalation, but this is the exception, not the rule. Also in pericarditis, the pain may improve or decrease when you press on your chest. The pain here is sharp, stabbing pain here is also sharp. And this is different from myocardial infarction, which is dull, achy, squeezing, like an elephant sitting on my chest. Referred pain, radiation or propagation of pain. If it's pleurisy, it's going to propagate to the thoracoabdominal wall. So you can have pain in the anterior abdominal wall, believe it or not, due to pleurisy. It can happen. This is called a referred pain. And the nerve here is the intercostal nerve. Or it can refer to the shoulder. This is the phrenic nerve. Case of pericarditis, it refers to the trapezius ridge, and this is the scapula on the back. Hemoptysis here is more likely because there is usually a problem in the lung. Here it's less likely. Friction rub is biphasic. Inhalation, exhalation. Friction rub like sounds like this. So biphasic is like this. Inhalation, exhalation. But the pericarditis is triphasic. Systole, early diastole, late diastole. So here is like S1 and S2, and here is the next S1. So here is systole, and here is diastole. And diastole, of course, is longer than systole. So if it's triphasic, in case of pericarditis, you will hear it in systole, early diastole, and late diastole. So lub-dub, 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 <laughs> lub-dub, lub-dub. <laughs> If you ask the patient to hold his breath, the friction rub disappears. Why? Because the pleura is not moving. If you ask the pericarditis patient to hold his breath, the friction rub is going to continue because the heart is still pumping. Some notes. Rheumatoid arthritis and lupus can cause either pleurisy and or pericarditis. Note number two. Any unexplained serocytis in a female in her child-bearing age is considered lupus until proven otherwise. This is really important. Definitions. Water in the pleura is called hydrothorax. Hydro means water, thorax means thorax. So hydrothorax is fluid in the pleura and this is usually a transudate. Blood in the pleura is hemothorax, air in the pleura is pneumothorax, chyle in the pleura is chylothorax, pus in the pleura is spirothorax, and this is usually an exudate. What causes that transudate? Number one, increased hydrostatic pressure, such as CHF, congestive heart failure. Number two, decreased oncotic pressure, such as cirrhosis or nephrotic syndrome. Or if you want to be super sophisticated, there is a disease called Nephrotic Syndrome of the GIT, Minitrier disease. And I've talked about Minitrier disease in a previous video. So, cirrhotic, nephrotic, and CHF. Cirrhotic, nephrotic, and CHF is a transudate, causes hydrothorax. 
All right. So what causes exudate? Is it increased hydrostatic pressure? No. Is it decreased oncotic pressure? No. So what is the cause? Increased capillary permeability. That's an infection, baby, or an inflammation. What causes chylothorax? Ruptured thoracic duct. What causes pus in the pleura? Many stuff, like infection or something. We call this pyothorax, which is pleural empyema. All right. Empyema is what? Empyema is fluid accumulation in any body cavity. When it happens in the pleura, we call it pleural empyema. And this is not the same as pyemia. Many sophisticated students want to be smart, so they say pyo means pus. And emia means blood. So the definition of pyemia is pus floating in the blood. Shut up. This is stupid. It doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. Like you can read the whole entire freaking book of Harrison's or Robbins or whatever. It doesn't exist. There is no such thing as pus inside the blood. So here is a challenge for you. Show me a patient with pus floating in the blood and I will give you like $100. It doesn't exist, honey. Okay, but please don't like aspire pus from an abscess, like drain an abscess of a patient and then inject it to his vein. This is called stupid and it's malpractice and it's not called pyemia. So what is pyemia? Pyemia is a septic focus in the blood. Septic focus will go to organs and then when it goes to organ, it can form pus in the organ, not in the blood. Any disease that causes pleural thickening will lead to the pleura being more visible on radiography. Pleurodesis, when you have a patient suffering from recurrent pneumothorax and th like all of this crazy stuff in the pleura or it's like tuberculosis and you tried everything it's not working, close the pleura as if it doesn't exist. This is called pleurodesis. How do you do it? Add some like tap powder and this and ju just obliterate it. We're almost done. Management of tension pneumothorax, needle decompression or thoracostomy tube. If you want to do needle decompression, uh, try to be in the second intercostal space, which is between the second and third ribs. If you're doing a thoracostomy tube, usually we do it fifth intercostal space. This is done at mid axillary line. This is line this is done at anterior axillary line. To obtain a sample of pleural fluid, insert a large bore needle in the seventh intercostal space. But please be careful not to go deeper. You can injure the diaphragm, the liver uh, on the right side and the spleen on the left side. Lymph node. All of the lymph drainage from the right lung goes towards the right tracheobronchial lymph node. Most of the lymph from the left lung goes to the left nodes, and then some from the inferior part of the left lung goes to the right tracheobronchial lymph node. Translation. If you have painless left tracheobronchial lymphadenopathy, this is carcinoma of the left lung. If it's in that tracheobronchial lymphadenopathy, it's a carcinoma in the right lung or in the inferior lobe of the left lung. If you have bronchogenic carcinoma, it can metastasize to the brain, bone, lung, and adrenal, and this is called cancer predilection. Every cancer has preference for tissue to which to metastasize to. Didn't you tell us, like medicosis, that carcinoma goes to the lymph and sarcoma goes to the blood? So this is a bronchogenic carcinoma. It should only go to the lymph. All oh, right, sweetheart. So lymph nodes that drain the lung, where do they eventually go? They go to the big veins, right atrium, lung, left atrium, aorta, brain. So they can eventually end in the blood. Also, the bronchogenic carcinoma can erode into a sinusoid or a venule in the lung. Big veins, right atrium, lung, left atrium, aorta, brain. Case number three. A CEO went to visit the CFO in his house to discuss their latest shady accounting practices. Hey, 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 this sounds like yesterday. That were published in the national newspaper this morning. After a heated discussion and lots of cursing, the CFO grabbed a four and a half inch knife and stabbed the CEO in his chest. The knife passed just to the left of the sternum and pierced the chief executive's chest at the left fourth intercostal space along the left lateral sternal border. The accountant immediately regrets his foolish move, too late, and was so scared, but to his surprise, only a few drops of blood came out of the executive's chest. He called 911, the ambulance took the executive. On the way to the hospital, he didn't complain of shortness of breath, and the trachea was central. He arrived at the ER, and suddenly, he was short of breath, semi-conscious, in shock. Two minutes later, he gasped for air, became unconscious 
and died. What's the most likely cause of death? So you told us like case three and case four, where is case one and two? Previous video, honey. A one and a half year old boy started choking and he couldn't cough it out. His mother tried the Heimlich maneuver and the toddler seemed to improve and stopped coughing. 45 seconds later, he started coughing again and he was grasping for breath. So she took him to the ER. The doctor asked her, did he swallow any foreign body? Doctor, you mean like inhale, it's not swallow. Okay, we get it. The mother recalled that there were some peanuts scattered over the floor after the birthday party. Why would you like do a birthday party if your kid is just a year and a half? Do you celebrate his birthday every month or what? Oh, it's, it's none of the, our business. Which of the following is a possible complication of the peanut inhalation? Thank you guys for watching. Please subscribe and join the tribe. Hit the bell to get notified. Go to Facebook. I have more than 100 cases there. Go to patreon.com slash to get all of my notes and all of my cases. Thank you so much for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard.